The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. I've got a ton of great Mitt Romney and Ann Romney clips from over the weekend, but before we get to those, I want to first, just to get it out of the way, let's talk about this Rush Limbaugh clip. Uh, re- there's been this research study done which indicated that the average size of a male penis is about 10% smaller now than it was 50 years ago. Now, the reasons that the stress uh, that the test cites for this uh, uh, reduction are three. Excess weight gain, particularly around the waist, environment, environmental pollutants in the air have had a negative impact on penis size, and then stress, smoking, and alcohol intake may be playing a factor. Now, Rush Limbaugh heard this, and he had a different idea. His idea was, this must be uh, feminists. Feminists, or as Rush calls them, feminazis, are the reason for smaller penis size, Lewis. Here's what Rush Limbaugh had to say. I have a story it's from Philadelphia, CBS News, CBS Eyeball News. If size matters, male private parts are shrinking, according to a new Italian study on sexuality. <laughs> the study's leaders, kids are back in school now, it's okay. Well, it's September 20th, it's just adults out there now. The study's leaders claim to have bona fide research. I say bona fide, probably here. Bona fide research. So that funny. says the average size of a penis is roughly 10% smaller than it was 50 years ago. And the researchers say air pollution is why. Air pollution, global warming, has been shown to negatively impact penis size. Italian researchers. I don't buy this. I think it's feminism. I think if it's, if it's tied to the last 50 years, the average size of... Uh, Member is uh, 10% smaller than it's 50 years, has to be the feminazis. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, it's the feminazis. So this is interesting. I mean, I guess we've, we've, this study certainly confirms but through Lush, Rush uh, Limbaugh's reaction uh, what his specific insecurities are, don't right. you think? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, he's just trying to come up with an excuse for himself. Um, from all the statements I've heard Rush Limbaugh make over, over the years, I've never really considered him an expert on anything, but maybe he really is an expert on shrinkage. I don't know. Could be. Um, he's certainly an expert at uh, embarrassing himself, which <laughs> so he has that, done yet again. Yeah. So there it is. Feminists are the reason that penis size has decreased in the U.S. Then Ann Romney. Ann Romney did this strange interview where she responded to criticism of Mitt Romney. And she always seems to have been pretty sensitive to that. And she basically said, leave Mitt alone. You want to try it? Get in the ring yourself. Here's some audio from that uh, interview that Ann Romney gave. Stop it. This is hard. You want to try it? Get in the ring. This is hard. Mrs. Romney's latest efforts at damage control represent a shift in... There you go. You know what it reminded me of? You know what's coming. Um, no. It reminded me of this video. Ann Romney's complaining and saying, stop it, leave Mitt alone, reminds me of this. She hasn't performed on stage in years. Her song is called Give Me More for a Reason because all you people want is more, 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 more! Leave her alone! (laughs) You're lucky she even performed for you bastards! That's exactly what my mind went to when I heard uh, Ann Romney saying, Stop it. Stop it. But she's right. It is difficult. It is very difficult to pretend to be a completely different person. (laughs) Day in and day out. (laughs) Day in and day out to to have to monitor what you say so carefully. Right. Uh, It is difficult. Yeah. To hide your taxes from people. Imagine if, if Michelle Obama said, stop criticizing my husband. This is really tough. She would be laughed out. It would, the, the, the claims from the right wing media would be they can't handle it. She can't hack it. She's bowing to the pressure. She just can't handle it. This is not the right president because his wife is saying stop bothering him. But when it's Ann Romney, it's, oh, you know, the, the press is being very mean to Mitt, asking questions, asking him why his position is different every day. and Stop it. Stop it. Ridiculous. Leave, leave Britney alone. Ridiculous. <laughs> Fox and Friends did a story about a Fox News poll and then basically said, don't pay attention to that poll. We don't really think it's a good poll to look at. Their own poll. This is so funny. This is from Fox and Friends outlining how 
in Florida, Ohio, Virginia, in so many swing states among likely voters, President Obama is taking a significant lead and then basically saying, F forget about that poll. Take a look at this. This is incredible. News polls give President Obama an edge in three key swing states. He's up five in Florida, seven in Ohio, and seven in Virginia. But that's with all likely voters. Once right. you isolate voters who are extremely interested in the election, <laughs> the race is much closer. And those with those voters, Mitt Romney is down just two in Virginia. He's tied in Florida, and he takes the lead in Ohio by one. And we just found out Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan are heading to Ohio for a bus tour at the end of, or rather at the beginning of next week. Monday they'll be in Lima. Tuesday they'll be in Cincinnati and so Dayton. So first the and thing they do is they isolate out. They're like, listen. It's really not looking good, but if you only look at voters that are extremely, ex uh, what was the term? If the voters are uh, extremely likely, then it's much, much closer. Right, because likely voters don't vote. Only extremely likely voters vote. Perfectly reasonable. I, I, yeah, I don't understand uh, the reason for pointing that out. I don't see how it... It's to make it seem closer. Of course. And then here's Gretchen Carlson. This is how Gretchen Carlson responds to this. I, I love this. I think, I think one of the first times that we should look at the polls in real sincerity is after one or two of the debates. <laughs> because hopefully the two candidates are going to be talking about the issues that the American people want to hear about. And hopefully the questions will be fair to both parties. So it's an and interesting point, right? I mean, she's saying... She's 100% she's, she's right, though. That is we, a valid point. Well, but it's a valid point. But the thing is, so you can't consider your own company's polls real sincerities because the the uh the debates haven't happened but natan was just talking to me before the show about how when you look at the polls right now and compare it to how the election turns out almost always accurate weren't you saying that natan yeah i mean it what she's making a good point in theory in practice it doesn't really matter for two reasons one the aggregate of the polls show obama taking a lead nationally and in all the swing states right and then separately like you said there's a correlation between you know 50 days out of the election who's winning and then who finally wins the election no it's it's perfectly reasonable what she's saying in theory but i yeah. just it's just funny that it's the, her own polls that she's saying we don't really want to pay, pay attention to these it's only my employer that did them that is strange i think little does she know that obama is going to widen that gap after the debates. Can you imagine what would happen on Fox News if President Obama is reelected? Yes. Um, it's it's going to be chaos. <laughs> I mean, it, are they going to start saying it's the end of the world or are they going to start thinking about the next election? Are they going to start touting uh, Republicans uh, for the midterms? I don't know. I think on November 7th, Fox News is going to be interesting to watch no matter what happens on November 6th. That's my sense. It will be a, a circus, I'm sure. Let's talk a little bit about books. Every Monday I do a book recommendation made possible in part by A Fashion of Bastards, which is Joanna Louise Johnson's satire, best-selling satire, involving the bizarre world of Washington's power players and their misuse of America's most precious natural resources. It's on Amazon.com. Most people have heard, Lewis, of the book Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. You've heard of it, of course. I have heard of it. That's not the book I'm recommending. And usually when I recommend this book, Orient Express by Graham Greene, people say, oh yeah, yeah, by Agatha Christie, right? Even though I've just said, no, 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 it's, it's by Graham Greene. It's fascinating in that it's similar to Murder on the Orient Express in that it takes place on the European three-day trip on the Orient Express train, of course, which everybody is, of course, familiar with, but it's a totally different story. It actually involves, um, it's, it's not a murder mystery per se. It's more of an espionage, international politics uh, story. Strangers kind of come together in uh, very uh, uh, coincid apparently, seemingly coincidental circumstances. It's fantastic. As whether or not, you, if you haven't yet read Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. Reading this book will make you want to read it. And if you have already read Agatha Christie's book, then you'll be even more into the book right away because it's a setting that you're already familiar with. Uh, very, very good book. Highly recommended. I think you would like this one, Lewis. Thank you. Trust me, Dave knows his stuff. Listen to what he says. Don't question it. Don't doubt it. Just do what he says. I don't get it. Is, is this your new material? Sure. Natan, any thoughts on this week's book recommendation? Um, I haven't uh, read Orient Express, but I have read The Third Man from Graham Greene, which is excellent. So I, I definitely would recommend uh, his works in general. Also, as a side recommendation, I, re I would recommend reading Our Man in Havana, also by Graham Greene. Excellent, excellent book. And isn't there a pretty well-known movie done on that one, Natan? Uh, Our Man from Havana? Yeah. I don't know about that. 
I think there is. There's a sensational movie uh, with Orson Welles on The Third Man, I might add. What year is that from? Uh, I think 49. Is, that a, is it good? Oh, it's great. It's one of the best movies ever. Wow. Lewis, as a student of film, what's your reaction to that? Uh, I have not seen it, but I am a fan of, of the works of Orson Welles. So, he actually go. didn't direct it, but he's definitely a key part of it. Very, very good. Uh, an amazing actor. So anyway, the recommendation to be clear, Graham Greene's Orient Express. Read it. Let me know what you think. Great, great book. Today's bonus show, hosted and produced by producer Louis Motomedy. We'll talk about three things. We will talk about spanking in Texas schools, a same-sex spanking policy with parental permission exists in Texas schools. A lot of people don't know about that. It shouldn't exist. We'll right. talk about that. Also, victims of the Aurora Batman theater incident are suing Cinemark. We'll talk about that lawsuit. We'll talk about a number of other things related to it. And also, the Senate has voted to shield U.S. airlines from an EU carbon tax that is being placed on trips going to or coming from Europe. So we'll talk about that as well. DavidPakman.com slash membership. Get the bonus show. It's, a, it's fantastic. It we'll is. take a break and be back after this. The David Pakman Show at DavidPakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Support The David Pakman Show by doing all of your Amazon.com shopping through the black banner at davidpakman.com. You click it, you bookmark it, you use it every time you shop, and you take 7% of your purchase away from Amazon, and you give it to The David Pakman Show. You can also support the show by being a David Pakman Show member, made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Life's just not fair to conservatives, Lewis. Everywhere you look, it's liberal bias. You can find the best examples of our liberally biased reality at liberalbias.com. Today's new member of the day, Thomas Saunders. It's great to have Thomas Saunders on board. Every David Pakman Show member is hugely important, and Thomas is doing a, a, a great thing in supporting strong independent media instead of boring, homogenous corporate media. Yeah, it is, it is crucial to us that we have uh, member support. Absolutely. DavidPakman.com slash membership. A couple notes. Number one, we've launched a new YouTube channel, youtube.com slash TDPS interviews. Now, the point of this channel is a lot of people say, I really like checking out all of your interviews, so please separate them in some way. The other thing is, a lot of times we don't put the full unedited interviews on our regular channel just because we put the, the show versions there, which sometimes have to be cut down for time. We're going to be uploading over time, and we've already got a couple of these interviews up, a lot of new extra expanded interviews and things that haven't necessarily aired on the show, Lewis, at youtube.com slash TDPS interviews. So subscribe to that. It's free. It takes a second, and we're going to be going through putting up a lot of our best interviews, hundreds of interviews over the years, Lewis. Yeah. Too many, really. It has been a long time. Lewis would prefer less interviews, actually. Well, no. I mean, the more the better. We, ha oh, we okay. have some gems, and they go back, what, five, six years? Absolutely. Yeah. It's good. Good stuff. Okay. And the other thing is, the David Pakman Show, we've got some upcoming legal needs. We're not getting sued yet, fortunately, but we've got a couple of different legal things we have to put in place. And uh, before we just kind of look up and hire a lawyer, if there's, uh, if there are, I, I know there are a number of attorneys that listen to the show. If uh, you have some experience in this and may want to help us out either pro bono, a reduced fee in exchange for some, uh, some advertising on the show, we're interested in talking to you. As, as you know, Lewis, as the show continues to grow, legal complexities can arise. And we, we now have the need to actually get, uh, I can no longer handle all of the legal things myself. A lot of people think I am a lawyer. I know that's a common thing when you tune into the show. The first thing people think is, David Pakman must be a lawyer, but I'm not actually. Yeah. David actually is, uh, is about to get sued by uh, hundreds of shampoo companies. <laughs> right. <laughs> for misuse of misrepresentation of their product. Right. It just doesn't seem to be working. Yeah. Right. So uh, in any case, go to davidpackman.com, click on contact us, and then we can kind of go from there. Speaking, by the way, of, uh, of, of homogenous corporate media, this story broke on some blogs last week that Mitt Romney appeared to have dyed his face brown for the Univision interview in front of a lot of Hispanic voters or potentially Hispanic voters. Um, and it's funny because mainstream media was like afraid to cover it in a way where they're saying this is a story. So they were doing the wishy-washy thing of saying, 
It's being discussed or reported by others that Mitt Romney appears to have done this, but nobody would actually just say, we're embracing this. We say Mitt Romney appears to have done this. Nobody, nobody did that. Did you notice that in the coverage? Yeah. Um, and that's, it's ridiculous. I mean, what are they afraid of? Let's just, let's call a spade a spade here. Well, in other words, if they're wrong, they don't want to be accused of making accusations that are unfounded. What's clear is that Mitt Romney's face was very dark while his hands, as you can see in the picture over my shoulder, uh, the color of his hands did not appear to have changed at all. So let's look at a little bit of the video of Mitt Romney um, uh, apparently in brown face. And I don't know what this is all about. Maybe it's just bad timing for a tan. I really don't know. Here, here it is. While trying to court the Latino voter in a special interview on Spanish language broadcaster Univision, Mitt Romney wore brown face. <laughs> There's just no other way to say it. His campaign will surely blame it on a bad tan, but as you can clearly see, his... All right, so there it is. And as you can see, the, the arrow there pointing to his neckline, which is much whiter than his face. There's no question that Mitt Romney was tanned for this, and it appeared to be very clearly a fake tan because it's not on any, any other part of his body, apparently. It's just not clear that he did, did this because he thought it would give him an advantage with Hispanic voters. However, however, Mitt Romney just, just very recently was saying if he was Hispanic, he'd have a better shot of winning this election. Remember what Mitt Romney said very recently. Listen to this. My heritage, my dad, you probably know, was, uh, was the governor of Michigan and was the head of a car company, but he was born in Mexico. And uh, had he been born of, of Mexican parents, I'd have a better shot of winning this. But he was, you uh, have to admit, Lewis, you have to admit that if within weeks of a video leaking saying you'd have a better shot at winning if you were if you were Hispanic, you show up talking to Hispanic voters with a new tan, a very noticeable fake tan, a deliberate tan that makes you look darker. It's a little odd. I don't even know if it's a tan. Uh, it could just be makeup. But uh, I I'm going to take the plunge here. There is no doubt in my mind that Romney has been doing brownface <laughs> for political gain. He did it again last night on 60 Minutes. Yeah, but why would he keep it on 60 Minutes? I don't know. Do you really think... It, it, maybe it thing. was... Hold on. Maybe it was some type of actual just tan, and it has stayed on him for this period. But it is very clear that his face has been manipulated to make <laughs> him look darker, and there is no way it was for any reason other than for political gain and to win somehow help him win uh, Latino votes. The there other funny no thing is that if he actually did this for that reason, it's really stupid. Does he think that because he is a white man with a tan that Hispanic voters would be more likely to vote for him? It's really an insult. He, Mitt Romney, is if that's what he's doing, he's insulting Hispanic voters by assuming that if he tans, they're more likely to vote for him, right? I mean, that's at the core of this, if it is true, isn't it, Natan? I don't know. Maybe there's some focus group research that shows that, like, if uh, if a candidate has a closer skin color to you, you're more likely to vote for him, you know, um, no matter what his political beliefs are. I, I don't really know. But let me just make a note on the media's coverage of this. Yeah. I'm, like, very distressed about the whole thing. Like, if media organizations, major med media organizations don't know whether this is true, how about just, like, investigating it and finding out? <laughs> how difficult can it be to run an investigation and find out from someone in the Romney camp whether this was like some sort of a ploy. They would just say he was at the beach. I mean, you know, it, it, I don't think that that's the real way to go about it. Well, yeah. I mean, aren't media organizations supposed to investigate stories and find out the veracity of claims? Of course not. Not this day and age. He was at the <laughs> beach wearing a special suit that covered everything but, <laughs> but the front part of his face. <laughs> well, he may, you know what's a good point? If he was wearing like one of those body surfing or, or, or whatever, whatever suits he wears, his hands would have mostly been under the water, which would provide some shielding from the sun, and really maybe just his, his face would have tanned. I don't know. Romney did brown face. The more interesting thing is that Mitt Romney threatened to cancel the Univision Forum altogether if the organizers didn't allow him to bus in his own supporters, which is not of any surprise because Mitt Romney doesn't have that many Hispanic supporters, as we know. He's relying overwhelmingly on the white male vote. And the campaign threatened to reschedule the event if organizers didn't let him uh, bring in his own rowdy activists from the southern Florida area. Any surprise on that? I'm not surprised one bit. No, uh, not at all. Didn't he do this? Was it, did he do this before? Or was it... Uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't Someone... remember now. I know we've talked about busing in supporters. 
It was the. I a think it was, wasn't it related to the Wisconsin protest where it was out the, of no, state the NAACP groups, thing. Oh, the NAACP yeah, thing. Yeah, he brought in yeah. his own black leaders, like the three that support him, and then yeah. met with them afterwards. That's, That's right. right. That's yeah. exactly what he did. The other really funny thing is that it's being reported that Romney didn't come out on stage. He like threw a tantrum backstage and wouldn't come out when the host introduced him, introduced him and said, uh, Governor Romney has given us 35 minutes tonight. Tomorrow night, President Obama has agreed to a full hour. Romney threw a tantrum and said, that would, I'm not coming out. That's a biased introduction. And I guess Univision had to retape the introduction in order to get Romney to come out. That's incredible. That's the more incredible part of all this. Uh, I'm glad this has been reported. I mean, you're just stating facts, aren't you? Mitt Romney will be here 35 minutes. That's, that's what he has agreed to. President Obama has agreed to 60 minutes. Nope, tantrum backstage. That's, that's biased. Panic. Desperation. Indeed. No question about it. You know, um, can you imagine a presidential press conference with Mitt Romney? He would demand half the press corps be made up of Fox News correspondents. Mm -hmm. Actually, he would probably go further. He would demand the press corps be 53% Fox News, and then it would be 47% not Fox News, but he wouldn't care about the not, not Fox News 47%. He just wouldn't answer their questions. He's not concerned about those people. He's right. not concerned about the 47% that wouldn't be Fox News. Yeah. Um, okay. 60 Minutes yesterday. This is incredible. Lewis texted me last night saying, Romney's on 60 Minutes. He's got the brown face. So I tuned in. And incredibly, Mitt Romney was asked about, do, do people deserve some basic level of health insurance? And he said, uninsured people can just go to the emergency room. Uh, Mitt, that's the problem. The problem we're trying to solve is uninsured people going to the emer emergency room. That's not the solution. Here he is talking to Scott Pelley. Does the government have a responsibility to provide health care to the 50 million Americans who don't have it today? Well, we do provide care for people who don't have insurance. People, uh, we, if someone has a heart attack, they don't sit in their apartment and, and die. We, we pick them up in an ambulance and take them to the hospital and give them care. And different states have different ways of providing for that care. That's the in, most expensive way to do it. Well, the, the in the emergency room. Different, different, again, different states have different ways of doing that. Some, right. some provide that care through clinics. Some provide the care through emergency rooms. In my state, we found a solution that worked for my state. But I would. This, I, it's so hard to believe he's even saying this. And I'll talk about why. But Mitt Romney's got to finish the debate with himself. You know why? Because. Recently, on Morning Joe, he said one of the main problems with the health care system is uninsured people going to the emergency room. This is not Mitt Romney and my point of view. This is not Mitt Romney and President Obama's point of view. This is Mitt Romney arguing with something he said just a couple years ago. Listen to this. Collaboratively, back here in the domestic stage, you and the late Senator Kennedy work collaboratively on establishing a health plan in Massachusetts that basically encompassed on a statewide level universal coverage. Yeah. Do you believe in universal coverage? Oh, sure. <laughs> look, look, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to have millions and millions of people who have no health insurance and yet who can go to the emergency room and get entirely free care <laughs> for which they have no responsibility, particularly if they're people who have sufficient means to pay their own way. Wait a second, Mitt. So you're saying if people have the money to buy insurance, we need a system that prevents them from choosing not to buy the insurance, calling up the ambulance, going to the emergency room and getting a whole bunch of service that they're not covered for and maybe aren't going to pay for. Uh, great back and forth on this topic. It's just that it's the same guy arguing with himself. Yeah. Uh, typical Mitt Romney. But I, I mean, his way to, the, the way he's suggesting fixing this is the problem. Right. And another big problem is that he will not get called out on this in any of his interviews because they're all softball, lame. Well, Scott Pelley did at least say that's really expensive. He didn't push it nearly as hard as he could have. And it sounds like he didn't want to bring up uh, which I'm sure he knew about, the clip we just played. Don't, Natan, it's weird that he's even doing, making statements that are just so easy to, to refute, don't you think? Yeah, it's just, it's unclear who, I mean, he's obviously trying to appeal to the Republican base, and the Republican base doesn't agree with this idea of, you, any word like universal, state-sponsored, um, Obamacare, all of these terms don't appeal to the people that he's trying to appeal to now. Right. But who was that guy in the video uh, two years ago on Morning Joe? I mean, it seems like that's a reasonable guy who I could vote for. Too bad he's not running. I don't remember. I don't, I don't, he looks familiar, but I don't remember who that was. Are you, do you really not know Natan? 
He's talking about Mitt Romney. <laughs> oh, I thought he was talking about the guy asking the questions. No, no I'm talking no, about No, the guy Mitt asking the questions I thought was making really good is. points. Confusion. Okay. Yeah, no, that Mitt Romney wasn't that bad. I that mean, was Mitt Romney agreeing with our views on what the healthcare system should be. Incredible. Yeah. Okay, a couple other things. We got the 2011 tax returns from Mitt Romney, a couple of interesting things in there. He did pay taxes right around 14%, so uh, less than, uh, certainly less than President Obama, who made much less money, certainly less than uh, the average person making $55,000 a year. A couple interesting things. Number one, Mitt Romney's trust divested itself of investments in Chinese companies just before his presidential run. Interesting. Not surprising. Mitt Romney, as we know, invested a lot of money in China, made a lot of money from China. Right. Number two, Mitt Romney numerous times now, including to Wolf Blitzer, saying that Russia is America's number one geopolitical foe. A big sur surprise to most people who are even remotely informed about what's going on in this, on this planet. And it turns out that Mitt Romney invested in a number of Russian companies which is, of course, our number one geopolitical foe. Interesting stuff from the Romney tax returns. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk to Alex Seitzwald from Salon.com about the panic in the Romney campaign, and then still plenty more to talk about after that, so stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Alex Seitzwald is a political staff writer for Salon.com. He's joining us today to talk about the increasing panic within the Mitt Romney camp. This, uh, of course, started with an article Alex wrote last week on, Sal on Salon.com. Alex, where do we really see the most notable type of panic from the right? Is it in the things Mitt Romney is doing? Is it in the right wingers that are kind of abandoning Romney? What, what do you think is the most notable thing? Oh, yeah, it's really all of the above. I mean, the, the most notable thing is that we're 42 days away from the election here, and we're reading stories that seem like they should be written the day after Romney loses. Uh, there was a Politico story about a week ago with a bunch of unnamed internal campaign sources kind of throwing Stu Stevens, who's the chief strategist, under the bus. And that's the kind of thing you expect to read uh, from a campaign that already knows it's losing and you have campaign consultants who are kind of looking for their next move, what's going to be their next job, and they want to uh, you know, preserve their own reputation and their own employability, so they're going to blame it on some other guy. And then uh, yesterday on the Sunday shows, we had people like David Brooks and Bill Kristol saying Romney has been going about this all wrong, Peggy Noonan, even Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, you know, huge GOP icon, saying the Romney campaign is doing a bad job of handling Paul Ryan. Uh, so there's just all-out panic in all corners of the right, and I think people are really nervous, and I would be too looking at the poll numbers. Yeah, it's funny because you're, you're right about some of the comments. They have the same kind of flavor and tone of the stuff you hear from. Who was the, I think it was, is it Steve Schmidt, the former McCain campaign advisor, who now a couple years after the fact goes on MSNBC and kind of shoots the breeze about the things they did wrong. It's the exact same type of tone we're hearing from some on the right in, in the heat of the campaign, which is pretty shocking. Uh, the other thing also that we're seeing is increasingly some Republican candidates that are running in, in Senate and uh, congressional elections are starting to put some distance between Mitt Romney's 47 percent comments and, and their campaigns, because understandably, it's a, it's a difficult comment to overcome if you're running where people actually vote, who are inevitably, inevitably part of that 47% that Romney is referencing. Do you think that this Romney gaff fest could influence Senate and, and House elections? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it might even have a bigger effect down ballot than it will in the presidential, where you already have people who have mostly made up their minds and there's not going to be very much to sway it. But in uh, blue states, in, in bluish districts, I think this will be a big, big problem uh, for Republicans. Tommy Thompson, who's running for Senate in Wisconsin, very popular former governor, said that directly, publicly said that Romney's comments have hurt him, which you almost never see somebody in the same party uh, saying. I went to a, a press conference on Friday with Steve Israel, who's the Democratic uh, campaign chairman. He's responsible for electing Democrats. And he said Romney, with these comments, will hand Democrats the House. That's, you know, people say that's a little overstated. It's probably not very true. But the fact that you have Democrats this uh, confident about these statements hurting people down ballot, I think there's something to that. 
The one place where I think the increased confidence on the left might hurt President Obama is increased confidence might make people not think they need to vote. Is that a concern that's being talked about at all in, in Democratic circles? We don't want to get overconfident because then Democrats might stay home. Yeah, if you talk to people on the Obama campaign, they're far more cautious than a lot of um, you know, progressive activists or just your average liberal voter because they're exactly concerned about this. They're concerned about complacency and they're concerned that people just won't turn out. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the Democratic base are, are uh, groups that historically don't turn out in big numbers. And one of the things that Obama did really well in 2008 was partly responsible for his huge victory was getting young people to the polls. So if there's this perception that uh, you know, they don't need to vote, that's, that's a real concern uh, in Chicago today. What about these undecided voters? We've been hearing more discussion like Bill Maher saying, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but something along the lines of if you're still undecided, you, you've got to be some kind of an idiot or something derogatory. And then we saw a Saturday Night Live skit that kind of parodied low information voters. How could you still be undecided? And I understand that. I mean, how could you really be so undecided at this point, given how much we know about these two candidates? At the same time, in the last 10 days, We've seen really big shifts in some of the swing state polls, meaning there, there really are, it, maybe it's not that they were undecided, but people are actually switching their votes. But who characterize these undecided voters right now? Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I think uh, the, the Bill Maher and the SNL characterization is actually true uh, to a large degree, at least of one segment of the undecided voters. And these are people who really don't know. And that's probably because they just haven't been paying attention uh, and they really are low information voters. But then you have a few other classes of people who, uh, you know, show up on polls as decided or leaning, but they might switch. And those are really hard for campaigns to uh, zero in on. Those are, you know, people a lot of times in uh, suburbs, in, uh, in districts that, that swing back and forth, like uh, states and districts that Obama won in 2008, but that John Kerry lost in 2004. So those are going to be really critical people, but they're really hard to identify and they come in lots of different uh, shapes and flavors. So when we talk about the undecided voter or a undecided voter, it's often not one type of person. Uh, it's, it's lots of different people. And that's who these campaigns are really trying to reach out for. All this money is being spent for this little tiny segment of people. Speaking of, of spending money on a small segment of people, this kind of gets me back to Mitt's 47% video. And you put out another article on Salon.com saying you think the 47% video may actually help Mitt Romney uh, overall. Make that case. Yeah, so uh, this is a little, uh, you know, far-fetched at first, it seems. But when you look at it, and this is different from down ballot, uh, when you're talking about the Romney campaign, they made a decision a, a couple weeks ago that they really are, you know, they're, they're a little bit ahead with independents, and so they're not going to worry about them, just like they're not going to worry about poor people. And they're going <laughs> to focus on, on turning out their base, because the base has never liked Romney. Through the entire uh, uh, Republican primary, you know, they, they switched around to everybody but Romney before they finally said, okay, I guess we'll, we'll vote for this guy. But if you go to conservative conferences, if you talk to really, you know, hardcore conservative activists, they are still not thrilled about Romney. So the Romney campaign from here on out is, is trying to really turn out their base and get their people to the polls. So a comment like that might actually help him among those kinds of people. If that's what... The the campaign is really focused on, and, and I'm, we're assuming that what they're telling the press is, is true here. You never know with the Romney campaign. Assuming that, it might actually help them. The problem is it hurts other people who are running in, who, who aren't concerned about their base and who are more concerned about appealing to independents, like uh, you know Tommy Thompson and these other candidates that we were just talking about. So while Romney might get some short-term personal gain for himself, he could be throwing his party under the bus and screwing them over. Yeah, it's the, the where I think it, what you say makes sense. At the same time, it's hard for me to imagine that this 47% uh, comment is really going to invigorate more people to vote for him from his base, who realistically on, on election day are not going to vote for Obama versus the number of people that are actually in the middle that might be c totally turned off. I guess it'll really come down to which states are the key people in that are offended or, or fired up by this. Yeah, I mean, I think probably the next that effect is negative, uh, but there's, there's, in, there's something to be said. It's not entirely negative, and I think there is some positive benefit here. And, and the truth of the matter is there's just a psychological uh, bias here and that people assume that they're not part of the 47%. Romney must be talking about somebody else. So they're not going to be offended when they hear him say that. Uh, Obama voters are going to be offended, but if you're inclined to vote Romney or you're not sure, you're going to just – it's human nature to assume that you're not a moocher. So you're not going to assume that's about you, even if it is, even if you're on Social Security or Medicare. Uh, so you might stick with them. 
All right, we've been speaking with Alex Seitzwald, political staff writer at Salon.com. Check out his, late, uh, his uh, recent article about the 47% video and also about the right wing panicking about this upcoming election. Thanks, Alex. Talk to you again soon. Thanks so much. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Please become a David Pakman Show member. It's the number one funding source for this show. We are mostly funded by individual members. Please go to davidpakman.com slash membership to sign up, read about all the great member benefits. Over the weekend, I saw The Master uh, by Paul Thomas Anderson with Philip Seymour Hoffman, Joaquin Phoenix, Amy. Is it Amy Adams or Amy McAdams? Amy, Amy Adams, Rachel right? Is McAdams Natan's mic even on? Amy I don't think Adams. we can hear Natan, as usual. Yeah, I just corrected you. Thank, so it's Amy Adams. Yeah, Rachel McAdams is the one you were thinking of. Right, very good. So there's kind of like controversy, I guess, even though I don't really think there should be over whether it's really about Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard or not. Some of the actors, I've heard them playing coy. Like I think Amy Adams was asked whether it's about Scientology, and she said they didn't tell us that it was or something like that, but it so is, and the movie's spectacular. Are you going to see this, Lewis? Uh, I want to. I'm a huge fan of uh, of the director. Right. Yeah. But so are you going to see it? Yeah, I'm going to at some point. Yeah. Okay, just checking. I'll see it. Okay. So in a sense, the movie is it's really more about Dianetics than Scientology, which eventually came to become Scientology. I, I may be mentioning some spoilers here. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, you may want to tune out. But I think I'm going to be careful about kind of what I say. There's so many similarities. So in the movie, they do processing, which is identical basically to the Scientology process of auditing, of, of uh, doing, the, it's, it's almost like a faux therapy type of thing. Um, there's images of Philip Seymour Hoffman doing the processing, which are identical to old images of L. Ron Hubbard doing the, pro the auditing with a person laying down and people standing around watching. Uh, they talk about the universe, the Earth is a trillion years old, and one of the Scientology tenets is the, the universe is way, way, way older than any science uh, believes it to be. Mm -hmm. um, there's a scene where a guy tries to kind of debunk Philip Seymour Hoffman's character while he's doing the processing, which may be representative of when Morris Fishbein tried to debunk L. Ron Hubbard's uh, uh, Dianetics, whatever it was. And in, in January of 51, the New Jersey Board of Medical Examiners started proceedings against L. Ron Hubbard's foundation for teaching medicine without a license. There's a scene in the movie where uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character is arrested for uh, an unlicensed medical facility, teaching, whatever. So very, very similar. And then in the movie, at a certain point, Philip Seymour Hoffman moves the cause, as it's known in the movie, to England. And of course, in 59, L. Ron Hubbard moved to England and stayed there until the mid-60s. So very clear that that's what the movie's about. I know, Natan, you know about Scientologists actually tried to prevent the movie from even being made. Is that right? Well, at first it was just a rumor, but then uh, the producer of this movie came out uh, a couple weeks ago and said that, in fact, it, it was true that there were some high-profile Scientologists in Hollywood that tried to have the movie stopped. Right. Fortunately, that didn't work, not only because it's incredibly entertaining, but it does get people... I mean, for example, after I saw the movie, I went home and I read the Wikipedia, the entire Wikipedia on Scientology, and then a lot of the subtopics started Googling and researching those. So if people are aware of the connection, it should bring about a lot of awareness of the bizarre nature and, and even uh, 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 just, just the cult-like essence of Scientology. Be careful, Dave. You're going to become labeled a suppressive person. I know. I don't want to be labeled an SP. I guess 20% of people are not uh, uh, buy, they don't buy into the, the, the nature of Scientology. They're suppressive persons. But most of those 20% can be brought over to Scientology with the proper uh, procedures. Proper only, channels. Only a small percentage are actually destined to be suppressive persons indefinitely. They can't be cured, so to speak. That's good. So there you go. Hopefully yeah. I'm, not, I'm not in that group. Last Thursday, we had our latest trivia question. The question was, which country in the Middle East is the biggest consumer of the David Pakman show? We had a lot of people email in on this. Incredibly, only two people 
got the right answer. And they are, of course, going to get free David Pakman Show memberships. A lot of people said it's Iran. Iran because Lewis is, his dad is Iranian, and it must be that in Iran, people are big fans of the David Pakman Show. That would be not be right. That Valid would be incorrect. Guess. Valid. Valid guess. The other one a lot of people said is Turkey, saying Turkey has a large population. We believe Turkey is the biggest Middle Eastern consumer of the David Pakman Show. They would also be wrong, Lewis. Interestingly enough, the correct answer, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the Middle Eastern country where the David Pakman Show is most watched and listened to. Two people had that right answer. Eric Mace. Eric Mace had the right answer. And then this one, the person's name was in Cyrillic, actually. I believe they are, they are from Russia. In any case, uh, I was able to translate. The first name is Dima. So congratulations to Dima and to Eric Mace with the right answer of Saudi Arabia. They'll get free David Pakman Show memberships. Great stuff. Just for, just for throwing a, a country's name out there. It's incredible. You send an email with a country's name, you get a free membership. What a nice guy you are. Absolutely. You are a saint. So Thursday, this next Thursday, we'll do another trivia question, and then we will continue to give away some free memberships, Lewis. But please, don't wait around for the, for the trivia question. Support the show by getting a, a, a membership at davidpackman.com slash membership. No reason to wait. None. None at all. None I can think of. Yeah. All right. Let's get to your voicemail, email. A new station airing the David Pakman Show, FSU TV3 in Frostburg, Maryland. It's our first Maryland affiliate. Let's get right into some voicemails. A lot of voicemails came in about the subway grinding story we did, whether subway grinding should be a felony sex crime. Here is one of those voicemails. Hi, David. It's Matt calling from Scottsville, New York. To your point about uh, subway grinding and whether it's just the woman's word against the man's word and whether it could be proven or not and whether there are witnesses, this happened to my sister about 20 years ago on the New York City subway when she was in probably her late 20s. And uh, it really bothered her while it was happening. It was well, yeah. a very, obviously, and it was in a very, very crowded subway car. And she said in the middle of it, you know, she was just sort of like stunned and didn't know what to do. She looked around at the people around her in this crowded part of the subway car. And she said, all the women were conscious of it. They were giving her sympathetic looks or they had angry looks in their face and they were looking in that direction. And she said, the men were just oblivious. They didn't notice it at all. All right, so some interesting anecdote there about the awareness. In other words, men very often aren't even aware that this is a thing to worry about. Who worries about subway grinding? And then here is another voicemail also about subway grinding. Hello. Um, I'd like to comment on the sex grinding uh, in subways as a crime in New York. I'd like to say that I completely agree with Lewis on this one. It should. Uh, it would be hard to enforce... And I think the first step they need to take is to um, absorb information on how to discern when it's intentional and when it was just an accident and whether they might need to... Scott Brown is pro-choice and he supports a woman's rights. Where did that come from, Lewis? Okay. Uh, I don't know what on earth that is. That, that That's was, your computer that was again. very, very weird. Um, so anyway, the point being made that it is hard to discern when it's on purpose and when it is an accident. That, it, it's, that seems to be the biggest problem for me. It's hard to enforce. You would think part of the, if, if we were to be honest and really want to fix this in a good way, we would be focusing not only on identifying this and punishing it, but on creating a situation where men aren't doing this, right? In the same way that instead of teaching women how to be careful about getting raped, about not getting raped, you would focus a little bit on a society where men don't rape. That would be that would be one approach, yeah. And a couple of uh, emails here on on Paul Ryan calling Mitt Romney inarticulate. Whenever a Republican tells the truth, the conventional talking point among other Republicans that it, is that he just misspoke or was inarticulate. Their positions are so radical, not even they would defend them. Yeah, it's a common talking point for sure. Yep. And the truth is, Mitt Romney has no fundamental values or ethics. He's very much like George Bush. He cares about being the big guy, the boss, the king on top of the mountain of money. He feels he's entitled to the presidency, and he'll say whatever he thinks will get him there. I can't say I disagree. He certainly seems to be saying anything at all. And doing anything to his skin color to, to try and give him an edge. <laughs> will it give him an edge? I doubt it. I don't think it will. Yeah. I don't think uh, it's an insult to think that Hispanic voters are that stupid. Right. All right, that's going to be it for today. Join us on The Bonus Show. The Bonus Show is great. Otherwise, we'll see you back here tomorrow afternoon. Thanks for watching.
David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.